Okay, last week I modified a trailer to go snatch up some logs, and in this video I'm gonna be slabbing them up. As milling is an entire world all of its own, I learned quite a bit in this past week, and I'm gonna try to cram as much of that information into this video as possible. So, let's just jump into it. There are two main methods for milling logs, a bandsaw mill, like Matt Cremona's, or a chainsaw mill. I'm going with a chainsaw mill, for now. I'm actually gonna jump ahead because there are a lot of components to this and I wanna show you the outcome before I get into the details of each one. The components are the chainsaw, of course, the mill, which is a railing system parallel to the chainsaw bar that guides you for a straight cut. On your very first cut, you need a flat reference for the mill to ride along, which is what these rails here are. Then something I put on mine, but is optional, is a winch. This is mounted to the mill and then hooks up to the bar that you see here. Now that you see what I end up with, let me go back to the beginning of putting everything together. Tractor Supply is now a supplier of Husqvarna equipment and I've partnered with them to use the Rancher 460 chainsaw with a 24 inch bar on my mill. Note that the chainsaw you buy has specs on the longest bar it can support. So if you want to cut certain diameter logs, be sure to buy a saw that can support it. I started off with the rails that will go on top of my logs to give my mill a flat reference for the very first cut. You might have seen people use a ladder for this application before, but I went with rails made by the same company who made the mill I'll be using, which is a family owned and operated company called Granberg. They are called easy rails and do come in a variety of different lengths, but I went with the 10 foot rails, which come in two five foot sections, and they can either be used separately or together. Next, I switched out the stock chain that comes on the chainsaw, which is a crosscut chain, over to a ripping chain. Just like any other saw blades, the teeth are specifically designed with a certain task in mind. And if you're going to be going from crosscutting to slabbing, you need to invest in a ripping chain. If you're curious, the teeth are filed to a much steeper angle on a ripping chain because it's a much more aggressive cut, since you're cutting along so many more growth rings lengthwise. After getting the chain on and tightened down, I moved on to assembling the mill that goes around the chainsaw. This is the railing system that is parallel to the bar and it can be raised or lowered to determine the thickness of your slab. And since I have a 24 inch bar, I went with the 24 inch mill. And just a fun fact for you, Elok Gramberg, who started the company, actually designed the first Alaskan chainsaw mill back in the 60s. So anything milling related, this company has. You can see that the chainsaw now fits right into the mill and then tightens down onto the bar to hold it in place. Like I mentioned earlier, an add-on that I opted in for is a winch on the mill. This will drastically reduce the amount of work I mainly have to do to get the saw through the piece of wood. And I'll show you how this works in just a few minutes. First, I wanted to set all of this equipment aside and quickly build a log stand so that I don't have to cut all of these logs on the ground. Since I've never done this before, I wasn't sure what setup would be best. So I went with some two by sixes with a steep angle cut in at both ends, then a hole drilled in the center. I flipped them around to be opposite of one another and then stuck in a bolt with a few washers and nuts. I used two nuts so that I could keep this joint pivoting, which will make the stand foldable. After repeating to make three of the same, I lined them out Use a clamp to hold them in the open position, making sure the feet were flat on the floor, and then placed another two by six to tie them all together and to also create a hard stop for them to open. Now you can see it can fold up and be stored or transported, but then quickly deployed to be used. Depending on your length of logs should determine how many of these X's you include on your stand. Okay, and after all that setup, I was finally ready to get a log on my stand and to start milling. Go to use the tractor to snatch onto a log on the trailer, then set it into position. Now, the log doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but the next step is easiest if it's somewhat flat. So I first started up my Husqvarna 460 and took off a high spot. I've never been able to do a drop start. Trust me, nuts. <laughs> I'll just do what works for me though. Set it on the ground and use my foot to stabilize it. With this being the first cut, I started by placing my easy rails in place. Again, these will be the flat reference for my mill to get a straight first cut. I lined up the cross members so that the spikes, or dogs, would all land on the log and then I hammered them in. 
With it attached, I next leveled up the rails. And you don't need to have them leveled along the length of the log, just across the log. I don't know if you can see, but there are two leveling screws at each of one of these cross members to make this happen. Then the last thing was to attach the winch's anchor point. If used, this is attached to the end of the log so that it can peek up in between the two rails. And you can see here that once you start the saw and get the mill on the rails, the winch cable on the mill goes from the reel to the anchor point and then reattaches back to the mill. This allows me to keep my left hand on the throttle of the saw and my right hand on the winch to advance or back off of the cut. A few things I want to say about milling. One, beware folks, because this is highly addictive. Honestly, I want to slob up everything now to where if you stand still long enough in my shop, I'll start attaching rails to you. Two, this operation can be done alone, but it is kind of a lot, and it is so much easier if you have a second hand around. You'll see Brian there cutting wedges for me and then placing them in as I get further into the log. This is to keep the slab from pinching your bar and binding. And then three, I tried moving the mill along without the winch just to see the difference. And I will say that the winch makes such a huge difference in how much effort is required. I 100% recommend it if you get into this. Now that the log has a flat reference along the top, I can just set the mill directly on top of that previous cut and start the process over again. The second cut took me just under five minutes to make. The main components for making that happen is much like any other cutting tool in the shop, having the correct amount of power and a sharp edge. This Husqvarna has no issues chopping through this oak, mesquite, or even pecan, which are all pretty hard woods. Cool. This work does use up the bar oil though, so make sure you're keeping an eye on your tank. Now I won't lie, I was pretty disappointed at this oak when I got a look inside. The inside was really cracked and honestly not something I was interested in keeping. Now I didn't have any more long logs, but my very awesome woodworking neighbor offered me a short pecan and mesquite log that he had. So I jumped at those to try next. You can see that instead of cutting the tops of my log stand down, I just shored up the bottom with some scraps. This is because I'm not yet sure what the average diameter of log I'll be getting is, and I didn't want to cut them too short, but note that this is an alternative to filling up the bottom of the stand. See what this thing looks like? Yeah. yeah. Too much slab, oh my goodness. It smells so good. Something else I did when the log got smaller was use the lock jaws in my super jaws. These are a set of jaws with blunted teeth specifically designed for grabbing onto logs. Oh yeah, and a helpful tip I got from Instagram is instead of placing the log level lengthwise, place it downhill gradually so that gravity can help you whenever you're milling through. Oh my goodness, look how pretty that one is. That one's real red. Woo, look at this one. Gorgeous. <laughs> as far as keeping things sharp, I sharpen my chain after every third pass, which might be excessive, but I'll learn with time where that sweet spot is on sharpening. In the past, I've always used a file to sharpen the teeth, but Granberg actually has this really cool 12 volt electric sharpener that attaches right to the bar. It hooks up to a truck or car battery, so I just use the battery from the log suction trailer to run it. The last thing I had to slab up was this crotch piece of pecan. After making the first cut, I stuck it in my super jaws to make the remaining cuts. And just look how cool this one came out. Oh, wow. I know the saying goes, life is like a box of chocolates, but I think it should be changed to milling is like a box of chocolates. You honestly don't know what you're gonna get. And it's so exciting. The next step in the milling process is to set these slabs aside and let them dry. And just a general rule is to let them dry a year for every inch of thickness. For example, a two inch slab, two years to dry. But for video's sake, let's just say it's been two years, these are now dry, and I'm ready to use them to make something. To use it, I will first need to flatten it. And since it's wider than a jointer, the most popular method for flattening a slab is called a router sled. You can make a homemade jig, but my friends over at Woodpecker's Tools heard I was slabbing and asked me to try out their new slab flattener coming out later this year. If you're familiar with woodpeckers, then you should already know that they excel at precision, which is exactly what a flattener needs to get the best results. 
Everything needs to be level and stay level to give you a perfect cut across your entire slab so that you don't have a lot or any post cleanup work to do. This jig has two long rails that I temporarily attach to my workbench. Then it also has a sled that sits onto these rails. Inside this sled is where a router base is set so that I can slide up and down the length. After taking my time to get everything set up, I position my slab and set the depth of my router bit to start removing material to flatten the slab. With things set up, you can see how it works. The router base moves along the sled, then the sled moves along the rails, allowing you to gradually move over the sled in order to flatten it. I'm using my Triton two and a quarter since I have my larger three and a quarter over on my router table. Then for a bit, I'm using a two inch flattening bit and also a bit extender made by Infinity Tools. If you don't have this extender and you just have the bit in a router, it's really common for the bit to run out of throw and not be able to get down far enough to actually hit your slab. Wow. And that is a wicked cool tool if you ask me. If you have never flattened a slab before, then here are a few things that I learned from my experience. When working with a piece that has a slight twist in it, you first need to shim it up and keep it stable to flatten it. Next, I set the bit depth according to the highest spot on the slab so that it starts off with removing the high spots. This means you aren't removing material everywhere on the slab on the first pass. And the objective is to keep removing all of the high spots pass by pass until you're finally removing material from the entire slab. And that means that it's all on the same level and is flat. I set my bit to take off about an eighth inch material. Also remember that with these larger diameter bits, you will want to slow the speed of your router down. And once I get the slab down to where I'm removing material from everywhere evenly, I change the bit depth for a final smoothing pass. And this is to just cut down on some of the marks left behind from the rough cuts. But honestly, if you keep your bit sharp, you'll be amazed at how perfect the surface feels. At least I was. If you were curious about the milling process before, then I hope that you found this video informative. I can't believe the amount of information I learned in just a week. And of course, now I can't wait until I have my own inventory of wood that I've milled up myself. If you are curious about anything that I used in the video, there are links for you down in the description. And don't forget that Tractor Supply is now a supplier of Husqvarna equipment. That's it for this one. My next video will be turning live edge slabs into furniture. So stay tuned and I will see you then. That's cool. Ha ha ha. Stop, 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 stop.